Um, today's discussion is, um, was brought about um, from an effort we started about eight or nine months ago. And this effort was to be able to benchmark Spring XD to find out how fast it was or what was the throughput for Spring XD. Um, okay. And so part of the um, experience, what we're going to be dis discussing today, is kind of broken down into three sections. Um, I'm going to be talking about message flow. And message flow is defined as what is the total throughput of data going from just a source and a sink. It takes uh, a look at the uh, transports that make uh, between the two, as well as um, the hardware and the measurements that you need to take in order to identify what your real message flow is or your throughput is for your uh, stream. David Taransky this morning is going to talk about serialization. So when you are talking about, you know, if I'm um, taking hops between various modules within my stream, what is the cost of serializing and deserializing the objects in which I am, uh, in which we are transmitting? And he's not only going to talk about some of the costs that are associated with it, he's also going to talk about some of the optimizations. Now, Stefan Aldani is going to come in after that, and he's going to talk about some uh, on the processor side. And with this processing, he's going to talk about some, again, some of the caveats that you're going to uh, be impacted by when you are um, writing your processors. And he's also going to show you some patterns that you could take advantage of that help uh, the processing speed and throughput of your streams. So, you know, kind of kicking off, um, you'll notice that there's two very professional looking icons up there. One is serialization, the other is the reactor symbol for processing because we're going, part of his discussion is going to be talking about some reactive coding that you can take advantage of. Mine, however, is the mythical beast from Good Mythical Morning. It's basically a chicken with a horned tail, dragon wings that breathes fire. Okay, now why did I say that or use that? Commonly, when we were starting the effort, we would have customers actually, actually ask me, can you do a million events a second? And the first thing that always came to my mind was, why not 1.1 million or 12 million or 2 million? Why does, why does it have to be 1 million events or even 30,000? Um, many, uh, many of the uh, uh, of the uh, customers that I've kind of had a chance to talk to or even work with, um, their message flow or throughput was not the million, but we've had talked to many in which, yes, it was not only just one million, it was 10 million or 12 million. So it's just a round number and they wanted to know what the throughput was. So as any good developer architect would always say, my first answer or question was, yeah, sure, but what? It depends, right? What is, how many processors are you going to need? How much processing is required? Have you already, or have you already been told what hardware you're going to be running your uh, app on before you even had a chance to size it? Um, how big is the message payload? How many hops are going to be in your stream? Each of these has an impact on the throughput of your, of your application. So um, the article you see at the bottom was actually the net uh, was actually the, the net fruits of that from several people's effort, and I highly suggest when you get a chance to click it, and it tells you what the throughput was for Spring XD, but it also shows you, you know, the kind of the effort that we went through to make sure. Uh, in this case, it was we were basing on a Kafka transport to show you that we actually measured Kafka on a set of platforms that we could actually provide you what Kafka, uh, basically prove that we can match Kafka's numbers using Kafka's testing uh, framework, but also using our testing framework, we could show that we were within that a certain margin. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So my, my portion is of this discussion is to kind of tell you some of the tuning that you can take advantage of with Spring XD to get that performance. It's also going to be talking about some of the hiccups that we found along the way. So you can take advantage of what we learned on the way. And then lastly, um, uh, we're going to talk about some of the um, 
uh, well, actually, we're going to show you some of the tools that we used in order to take, get this measurement. So the mantra of the effort actually came from this tweet from Charity Majors, in which she says, everybody lies with benchmarks, and here's how. It's really hard to read, but basically Mark Callahan said this, there's two types of really benchmarking. One is benchmarking that says it's informative, actually tells you something, and then there's benchmarketing. And its premise is, okay, we're here to impress so we can sell our product. My goal was what? To benchmark. So we're going to start off looking at thinking about hardware. Stefan and I had this conversation yesterday, and I'm going to go ahead and attribute this to him. He said, you know, when you're dealing with millions of events a second, you have to measure each component along the way, even to the hardware. And it becomes very apparent when you're working with customers and you ask them, what is the throughput? And their throughput is, you know, okay, we need to do, uh, let's say, 13 million events a second, or say, let's say uh, uh, 9 million events a second. And we say, sure, that's great. We can, yeah, we can, uh, or let me even take that drop. I'm gonna drop that number. I'm gonna say 900,000 events a second. We're like, sure, we can be able to do that. That's easy. How big are your messages? 100 bytes. Perfect. We can knock that out. Okay. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna actually go in and uh, want to measure your network. So we chose iPerf. I talked to a couple of you out in the uh, um, you know as the conference went on, and some people say, yeah, oh, that's actually pretty good. Some people say, I don't know what that is, and some person said, I wrote my own. I went. I want to talk to you. Um, so in that case, um, we used iPerf to measure the network speed. Um, the other thing that we did is we needed to be, make sure that we could actually measure the disk speed. Okay, In this case, we used DD. Now, before you say, okay, we all use DD, there's actually a caveat I'm going to talk about. There's something we discovered as a part of this effort. And then finally, processor speed. In this case, we used a specification. Some people said, well, you should be able to measure that as well. In this case, we found that most of the time, the specifications that they gave with the, uh, with the uh, chosen platform was pretty good and was, is, is pretty articulate for our, uh, at least the throughput uh, needs. So, okay, Glenn, we can do math. We know what one gigabit and what 10 gigabit is, but this was kind of important because one of the things that we have kind of stumped our toe on when people say, well, I want to do, in our previous example, I want to do 900,000 messages a second. Okay, what kind of um, network are you on? Well, we're on one gigabit, so we should be able to do it. And then the, what we found is, okay, yes, you should theoretically be able to get 1.25 million events a second on a one gigabit Ethernet for what? A 100 me megabyte size message. But what we found was, okay, if you run iPerf, if you're on like Amazon, and this is, now the number is a little bit floaty, but it was between 7.8 and, uh, or sorry, uh, actually I'm going to have to bump it up. I didn't do it for the one gigabit. We used 10 gigabit, so I can't lie. But I'm going to have to say 10 gigabit. But it was only uh, for the 10 gigabit at network, instead of getting um, the full uh, uh, 10 gigabit, what we got was like 7.8 to 8 gigabit, okay? When we went to um, Rackspace, we got 8.8 .8 to 9 gigabit. So my, my point is, is that you're not going to get the full speed of that network if it's 1 gigabit. You're going to get some substrate below that. It's also the message size is going to also impact how fast or how many messages per second. So it sounds basic. But understand what your plat when you're deploying your app or before you deploy your app, understand what the network throughput could be. The next hardware question was when you're using a disk to persist messages, you know, you want to know what your disk can write. So we the first thing we did was we deployed to EC2. Now this was back in the April, May time frame before they released their latest set of um, Virtual or virtual machines that have a, even a way faster disk speed than what was available, and what we were doing is we were trying to go out and actually measure what the throughput would be of Kafka, and we first test we did was against Rabbit Transport, and, or using Rabbit as a transport, and what we found was is that Rabbit did exactly what it said. It said it can do 30,000 events per second for a non-persistent queue. Okay, 
And so what we did uh, uh, did was, is okay, we said, great, we, we, we got that one pre done pretty quick. And then we ran the Kafka and Kreps paper, who sa he said, you can do two million events per second on stock hardware. And we went, okay, well, I can tell you, we didn't get nowhere near that. And there was two reasons, but the first reason was the disk speeds that we were using uh, just out of the box. It was said they were advertised as SSD, but what we actually got was something like less than 20% you know, of what we expected. So we said, all right, stop. There's something we're doing wrong. So we pulled in a subject matter expert on that AC tube, and I know a lot about it, but I didn't know that much. He taught me a lot. And we were able to get additional performance off of the EC2, but nowhere again, nowhere near. So what we had to determine was is that for, or at that time, back in April, now they have better servers. We haven't tested it since. We had to go to rack space on metal. And at that point, we got the speeds, the disk speeds that we wanted by using MetDD. But before I leave DD, you'll see that there's a big, nasty red X. And they say never use that, but I thought, well, this is a great way to show it, though. And what it shows is that you'll see two commands. And what we found was we'd always run a test. So the first thing is, was what? You're, you always test your network, you always test your disk, but test them multiple times, okay? One test does not mean you're done. Run a series. And what we found was the first test in the series was always faster than every other one, every time. Y'all take a guess why. Okay, I'm going to take a sip of coffee because I think I forgot. <laughs> the truth is, what we found was is that DD was using the disk cache. So what it would do is it would take and pump a ton of data in, but that first set of data was what? It was hitting the disk cache. The DD would finish, but the disk cache hadn't finished flushing to disk. Okay? So the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure your tests run consistently. If you have tests that go slow, slow, you know, this, you know, speed, speed, slow, speed, speed, try to identify why it slowed down. In this case, what we found was if we um, set the conv to F data sync on every test, what it did is it said the DD will not finish capturing statistics to all of the data is written to the physical disk. And what that means is that from that point on, all of our tests were what? Even. So, the next thing is message size. Yes, sir? Uh, quick question, and this is covered by my experience. Yeah, absolutely. Well, God bless you. That is another thing that you can do, and that's that you, so there's, there's several tests that you can run. These are very small tests that we ran in a series, okay? You do want to do durational tests, okay? So his point is exactly valid. So I could go in and run a test for, like if, let me put it this way, if I had set up a long running test on this, it would have been less obvious. But there's also times where you're going to need to test bursts as well. Yes, oh, absolutely. And it's also network speed over time. And it's also, and it depends on, it, it depends on the, the, again, going back to the network. If I'm running over a network, and so like right now, like I would run, did you notice when, or when I said that, like when we run the network, we would get anywhere from like 7.8 to 8? Okay, um, that's, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is when you're talking about millions of events a second, right? And so you get this float, so, it, and even then, I think that what, one of the things you probably notice is that you, had, you would walk, watch it and you would see these spikes and drops. And if you just did a floating average, it's like, oh, it's, we're getting this pretty nice even flow. But what you saw was, Smooth, whoa, smooth, high. And, but you want to also capture those peaks and valleys. And that's actually a fantastic point. And by the way, ask questions. If we're, if we're running shy of time, he's going to punch me in the hip to remind me that it's like, speed it up, Glenn, I got to talk.
But message size also has an impact as well. And the message, so here is a case where, and yeah, don't be too scared. Uh, actually, uh, the number, one of the things that show up, so message size. So this is what's called, in, this was using in-memory transport for Spring XD, okay? So what it is in this case, we're just using, uh, um, you know, the source and sync are in, using a transport that's in memory. But what I wanted to show here, and we're going to show the Kafka slide in a second, is that when you run in memory, and I'm running a, a message size of 100 bytes, we got about 13 million events a second, okay? But as you reach the message sizes of like 100,000 bytes, you go down to 12,500, and it looks kind of like, oh, well, yeah, keep your message sizes small. But if you look at the other chart, and you look at the, how the direct binding held out on megabytes per second, what happened was, in fact, that you were doing a, probably about 3,000 uh, megabyte per second, but the total throughput of bytes sent by the time you reached 100,000 was what? Close to 13,000 megabyte per second or 13 gig. So, or 14 gig, it's actually close to 14 gig. So in this case, there's gonna be two, I'm gonna bring this up again a little later. Can batching be utilized by your application order, in order to maybe expedite uh, or to be able to handle higher volume. And I'm going to show like an example with Rabbit in a little bit uh, how, you know, uh, with some real numbers, okay? So in this case, message size may be something that you can tweak, or I should say batching may be something you can take advantage of to increase your over, overall mega, uh, message throughput. So here's what happened when we got Kafka involved. As Kafka advertised, we did just over 2 million events a second. And so that was spot on perfect. Um, when we tested against XD, we were a little bit lower than we tuned XD, and we got it within 10%. We used based on a 100 byte message. And it was just as soon as we went to a 1,000 byte message, we went to about 600,000 events per second. And, but you know, after that, they kind of hold pretty fast together, so we start to see what the real throughput of uh, Kafka was. But again, this brings up another point. So we could see that we could actually see when the message bytes were at 100 bytes each, when we went to 1,000 bytes each, there was you know, a, a pretty nice spike in a total number of uh, megabytes per second sent, but then you see the plateau effect. And what I'm saying here is there's a sweet spot that you'll find based on your hardware, based on your deployments, based on um, maybe how much batching you can do before you actually no longer get a real benefit from it. So these are just kind of two slides that you can take a peek at as well. And it's, those were also, both of those were also on uh, the article that I posted earlier. So what have we done? We've tested um, the, the disk, we've, test, we've tested the uh, the uh, network, we have an understanding about the impact of message size on our throughput, but then we also have the transports themselves. So with Rabbit and Kafka, they both provide you a testing regime and framework. They also provide you a series of blogs that explain what their throughput was, here's our benchmarks, you should be able to do the same thing. So, like I said, with the Rabbit, we got exactly what they said. Um, and we used uh, their perf test tool that's, uh, that you download separate from the Rabbit uh, install. And it's basically a Java tools, and we used that, and we got 30,000. Here's the next thing you need to be able to do. Every time you upgrade your transport, or even your hardware, what do you do? retest it because there's going to be one of two things that's going to occur. You'll get what you expect or you're going to get a big surprise. My daughter is 14 years old. She is getting ready for college and every time I swear I have to put a quarter in the swear jar. She's using that for her college fund. She has decided to buy a Caribbean island because of this effort because every time I would get a surprise you'd hear what the hell? And so I had a what the hell in May. I ran Rabbit in February and I got 30,000 events a second. I ran and, uh, against, and when I ran it on XD, uh, 
And then I ran it again in May, and I got 20,000 events a second. So I went, okay, hardware's busted. I got a bad provisioned VM. Tested, the, used the tools to test that, perfect. Okay, something changed in the configuration, nothing. Let me check the, the see if their uh, configuration uh, setup has changed. Maybe they've added a new configuration, or maybe we're using default. They changed defaults. No. Okay, we screwed up our code. I look at our code. I perf our code. No. I'm starting to have crying and little tears coming out my eye. I, my daughter's up twenty dollars by this point. Finally, I said, "You haven't run your perf test yet." I ran perf test against three five three and three three five. 335, 30,000 events a second. 353, 20,000. I send an email to the rabbit guys, and they go, huh. And next thing I know, they pop it open a JIRA. And they fixed it in the, in the following release. I haven't tested the new release. Always test on new releases, even if it's a small change, because you might be the one that finds the bug. Kafka, um, here's the, uh, what we used in the Kafka test. Remember how I said that the Kafka numbers were not what they advertised? This was the second reason they weren't as advertised when we first did our test. What was the first reason? The disk performance wasn't what we expected. We had to change platforms. The second reason was is we used what was called the Kafka consumer perf test and the Kafka producer perf test. That's not what you see up here. And that was because if you read the Krebs article, he didn't use the Kafka producer perf test. He used the producer performance test, which is not available as part of the binary release of uh, Kafka at this time. You have to pull down the Kafka source code, build it, and once you build it, guess what? You get the performance. So always make, yes sir? Okay, that's a great point. This leads me to that question. Write your own. So a part of what you get with the Spring XD release is the tools we used to um, run those tests. His, again, since that you have their source code, you can look at their source code and verify. In our case, we, ran, we wrote our own and I'm going to jump back here, and Dave is going to hit me in the back of the head for going backwards. He said, only go forward, Glenn, only go forward. Um, is our numbers matched his? And our tests used. So that's a, his, his point is, can, you cook, can they cook the books? Yes, verify. Because when you're, when you're working with customers and they're expecting you to have three, four, five, 12 million events a second or even more, Better make sure that your perf tests are what you expect, and they should be, again, like you said, they should be repeatable. But verify, always. Good point. Um, so, like I said, write your own test tools. The next one is, there's two points here. Um, so, I'm going to go finish off the, cha uh, the, the discussion on when you do an upgrade, right? So, I'm hoping you'll learn that, that, you know, don't, you know, learn from our experience, because... <laughs> I don't want you to have to buy your daughter or son a Caribbean island like I have. Here's the next one that was a what the hell moment. So you see we went from 0811 to 0821. That's a pretty small release change, right? Wrong. That was a fairly significant rewrite of Kafka. Okay. More important, um, Marius, uh, was, who was working on the team with me had to go through and he refactored all the code uh, so that we could, so uh, on Spring integration or the Spring Kafka uh, project, he had to retweak it to go from 081 to 082. And we found a problem. It was incredibly slow after the rewrite. We're like, uh oh, this isn't good. And we start looking at it a little deeper. And I'm running the, the test, but I can, like I said, I've verified that everything else is the same. And we find out that their definition of batch size changed from 081 to 082. 
In 081, batch size is the number of messages in a batch. In 082, it's the number of bytes in a batch. So our original byte size was only like 400. And wow, Kafka sucks. What the hell? But the truth is, is it actually was just as fast. And if we went down and went down and dug into the definition, they changed like a couple of words in the definition, number of messages to number of bytes. Verify your configuration. Test between upgrades. It will save you a lot of headache. Um, the rabbit prefetch is nothing wrong with that. That has never changed, hasn't changed in years. But the most common question we get off of the rabbit is what uh, is we, we broke out XD, it was great, but when we ran it on a rabbit per uh, uh, transport, it was slow. And it's because we default the prefetch to one. That's probably the most safest prefetch you could ever have. This rabbit safe, you don't lose messages if you set it higher. We just decided that was the appropriate one for just safety for people to play with, um, especially when you're doing development, but when you go to production, uptick your uh, prefetch to what's appropriate. And the first thing I always say is, why don't you try five or 10? And when they do, they say, ah, okay, this is what we want. So, are there any questions on this? Is it, okay. Um, going back to the point where we talked about message flow, size of messages, the other is what we call spring batching, or, or sorry, uh, sorry, is batching. And with the spring AMQP, I just wanted to show you some numbers. Now mind you, this is on the, uh, the 353, this is prior to their update, is I ran a batch size of one and I got about 20,000 events a second like we talked about before. But if you take advantage of the RabbitMQ, or sorry, the uh, AMQP uh, release that just came out um, and you use their batching, you go from 18,000 to 158,000 events a second by just batching 10, and then finally, uh, and this is on message sizes of uh, 1,000, okay? Um, and if you go to 100, it's 453,000, and then we hit that plateau we showed before, right? It just, and so I said, uh, the third one is the last one we're gonna um, actually test against. And just to kind of finish this discussion, if you want to play with that, those are the um, two uh, quick boot apps I wrote to be able to test that. I should have wrote them in SES. I'm ashamed. I know, you know, Markle's going to tell me all about it. And you know, I'm down to my last two slides, guys. Congratulations, you have survived. Um, network hops. Each network hop in, hop in your stream is going to have a certain cost associated with it. I don't have those numbers with me. Um, I'm gonna to try to produce an article on that. As a matter of fact, when I showed you the Spring XD measurements, I've actually ported those over to SES, or Spring's Cloud Stream, and I'll be submitting a PR on those so that you can actually measure Spring Cloud Stream. The key here is, is that um, one of the things I've introduced in that suite is what's called the NOOP processor, so we can actually measure network hops as a part, or say network hops, but uh, module hops to be able so we can, you know, you can say, okay, let me check my infrastructure. I want to be able to test a source with three processors and a sync. What's the total time just with my infrastructure? Five processors, one processor. This is, uh, this is going to be more important also when David talks about, has his talk on how many times you have to serialize and deserialize. This may have a direct bearing on how you want or how many hops that you want to have uh, in your stream and be able to get the performance you want. Um, but quickly, uh, what happens if the number, of, it's, it's the number of hops that gets to be too expensive? Um, as a transport level, not, not before the serialization, you can do what's called direct binding, which says run the entire stream on one VM and means use in-memory transport. In that case, you get a performance boost, as we showed actually in the first graph versus the second graph. The second is what's called composing a module. When I compose a module, that means that I can take three or four modules and make them into one module. 
And when I do that, and I say, or say it's a simulated, and basically what it does is it says for those modules, instead of using like the Rabbit, Redis, or Kafka transport, all the other modules around those, those maybe those three that are in that composed module will still use the transport, but those that are in that composed module use in-memory transport. The critical factor to understand is if you decide to use direct binding or composed modules, if you lose that virtual machine, all messages in flight that were between those modules could be lost. So if you can't afford to lose messages, these two are out, okay? If, you, if it's like you're catching impressions or you know, just general data flow for maybe some sensors and you have a couple of clicks off and you don't mind, then use, these are perfectly viable. A custom module is something that we came up with as well as an option. If I have these three modules and we, the hops are, let's say, relatively expensive or more expensive than we like, why not uh, create a custom module where you take those three and you write, just take those steps and put them all in one module, and that way you don't have to do the deserialization, you don't have to worry about the network hop, okay? And one last thing. Whenever you decide, I'm just going to turn on JMX, there couldn't be anything that happens. Well, yes, there can. And this is something we found in XD. Enabling JXD's JMX, we got a performance hit. And so what we did was we said, OK, and we began an investigation. And what we found was, is that in Spring integration, they, um, it wasn't the JMX enablement that caused the impact. It was actually that uh, the way that X, uh, Spring integration was gathering its statistics, uh, it was rather expensive. And that was what was causing the net slowdown in the event or the message flow through our uh, streams. So what we did was, and one of the efforts that came out in the latest Spring integration is, They've come out with a um, uh, optimized exporter, so the uh, JMX impact is minimized, but there's still somewhat of a small impact. Okay, so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, is there any questions on just throughput? Okay, David. Thank you, Glenn. Um, uh, so so far, uh, Glenn has been talking about. Um, transporting byte arrays uh, through Kafka or Rabbit um, or through memory. So um, we're going to look at, well, a byte array you can't really do that much with. You, uh, you, know, you need to turn that into data. So typically uh, you could have POJO payload in, in XD. Well, if you're going to over a network hop, network I.O. requires a byte stream, write array. And so you have to turn your object into a uh, byte, byte array and, and back again. And so that happens in XD if you have source, pipe, sync. The, you know, the pipe takes care of that automatically. Uh, XD uses cryo uh, serialization, uh, which is a very relatively uh, very performant. Um, but also, and, and this is, um, happens in the message bus. So the message bus is configured with uh, what we call a codec, which is uh, the strategy for, for doing serialization and deserialization. Uh, but it's also smart enough to recognize if the payload type is already a byte array, then let's just pass it through the way it is. We don't do any extra overhead there. If it's a string, then we use get bytes, and, um, and we avoid cryo serialization. And, um, Cryo is, uh, is very fast, as we'll see, relatively uh, to Java serialization and other open source libraries. Um, but uh, we found in the field that um, at these uh, extreme uh, processing levels, that uh, from profiling, that uh, serialization becomes a bottleneck. So you know, I, I kind of spent some time looking at that and saying, like, what can we do about it? So XD uh, now supports uh, ways to optimize uh, cryo if you have known payload types uh, in your application. And you can take advantage of that uh, and tweak the default um, algorithms. You know, basically, cryo is very good at um, 
at doing reflection and, and instantiating objects. Uh, you don't, there's no constraints on zero R constructors or, or you know, any type of object graphic can traverse and it's very smart about serializing any payload type. That's what we need out of the box for XD. Uh, but typically if you're doing a custom stream and you, and you have domain objects that you want to process um, you, and you know that's the only types of objects you're going to, um, to work with at XD, then, then you can actually um, be smarter about how you serialize and you could you actually go to the Cryo API and, and write your own serialization, it vo avoids reflection. Um, that's basically it. Um, so we started looking at this, uh, found a very good resource uh, that you can look at uh, on GitHub uh, where uh, someone um, did a comprehensive look at uh, comparative benchmarks of uh, JVM serializers. This is a, a partial um, table of the results just for illustration purposes. Um, this is basically what would fit on this slide. And the, the idea is that, um, and, and also uh, if you look at the reports on this wiki, um, you may see some different numbers. I, would, I was surprised to look, uh, you know, just last week and was getting results um, in order of magnitude, or seeing results published on that wiki in order of magnitude higher than what I'm seeing here. But fortunately, you can, uh, you know, clone the repo, you can run this, these benchmarks on your own machine. And so this is uh, from my latest run on my MacBook Pro, um, you know, these kind of numbers uh, on commodity hardware. Um, and these, um, these benchmark tests where it says cryo manual and, and these are all uh, suffixes with manual means that uh, for these uh, sets of tests, this was the optimized, uh, manually optimized um, serialization. And we see cryo performs very favorably uh, compared to um, other common libraries that are used for serialization. And uh, we're talking about round trip uh, Sear, uh, taking the object to a byte array, um, and DSEER coming back and, and reinstanting the object on the other side. Uh, round trip total of uh, 1443 nanoseconds, which is blazingly fast. I mean, if you say it's incomprehensible how fast that is. Um, a nanosecond being a billionth of a second. Um, so let's say 1500 nanoseconds um, for, for serializing. Um, of course, if you're comparing apples to apples, uh, you have to use the exact same data in all these tests. Uh, that you know what we found is um, the the type, the object, the complexity of the object, the size of it, uh, the types of fields it has. Um, all of these things is is a uh, is the ba is the biggest factor in in those hard numbers. So, what uh, this particular suite uses. Um, and this is a JSON representation of it. It's uh, it's not JSON. It's a it's a POJO, but just just uh, to illustrate here, you know, we're looking at exact fields and exact values, and it's basically uh, a type called media content, and it has a object, uh, an aggregation called media, and then it has a, a list, a collection of images, and you can see these are kind of just simple strings and integers and you know, sort of a typical domain object. This one uh, would be something like you would use for uh, a catalog of, um, of videos that, that uh, you would want to show for, for a conference like this. Um, you see the Java keynote and here's the video, um, the, du the duration, et cetera, the bit rate, uh, all the metadata about that. It's not the, you know, obviously not the, um, the video content itself, um, and then a couple of, uh, say, thumbnail um, images that you would display up there. So it's, it's that kind of thing, just some metadata. Um, this is, the, like I said, the JSON representation, but we're really uh, taking a POJO and serializing and deserializing that, and this is the, the exact data that that benchmark used for, for every test. Um, which was important because we wanted to take our um, serialization framework that wraps cryo and see if we could kind of track these numbers as well. Um, 
Now, one thing I will mention as an aside is that if you want to avoid uh, using using cryo, I mean, you could, of course, um, pass strings uh, as JSON or XML. Uh, but you know, what happens there is that you get um, you get some JSON and you want to process that. You you want to extract some fields or do anything, um, any kind of processing with that data. Well, you're going to be parsing JSON. You use a Jackson or object mapper or something like that, and you're building you're building JSON nodes from the string, and you know that turns out to be you know a lot more expensive than serialization in general. So, you know you 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 uh, you're going to pay for it one way or the other, but you you know typically you're you know you're going to need to see what the data is uh, in a streaming application. Um, so when we, as I said. Um, Size matters here. We we played with uh, various types of domain objects, um, and just to put this in perspective, um, fifteen hundred nanoseconds is uh, fifteen thousandths of a millisecond. Um, doesn't seem like a lot of a lot of time, but to take Glenn's example, um, you know, and this is this is. Um, these numbers are a hypothetical scenario. I mean, we haven't actually benchmarked the kind of, done the kind of testing that uh, Glenn has done adding serialization in. So uh, it's kind of just a thought experiment. But let's say uh, we'll take some uh, data point that Glenn had shown on this graph previously, and we're using Kafka transport, and we're having 1,000 byte messages, and we're able to get roughly 500,000 messages per second through from a source to a sink. And so what that translates to is about 2,000 nanoseconds of processing time for a message. Well, at that kind of extreme level, serialization becomes uh, you know, a bottleneck. I mean, if, you're, if you add 1,500 nanoseconds to that time, then your message rate's going to drop. You know, if it's POJOs that are uh, producing 1,000-byte messages um, over the wire, it's going to drop you know, roughly in half. Um, so, even if you say, let's go an order of magnitude slower, we have a throughput requirement of 50,000 messages per second. Well, if you have, you know, something less trivial where you maybe have four hops in your stream, uh, this thing becomes, you know, linear scales are, it has linear complexity, so each pipe is going to do C or D, C or C or D, C or, uh, uh, Hypothetically, that could happen, and so you know, with, uh, even at sort of 50,000 messages per second, you might start to see this. I think it levels below that. You know, if there's like 5,000 events per second or 10,000 events per second, you know, you probably don't want to really even you won't even notice serialization costs. You know, at these extreme levels, you you'll see if you profile your app, you know, that um, you know cryo will, will pop up as a as a, to the top. Um, so let's look at how we could optimize this in XD, some of the, um, some of the tuning we can do. Um, first line of defense is there's a property, and this is in uh, XD 1.2, uh, called XD.codec cryo references. And if you set that um, to false, you can, uh, you can uh, save some time. And what that means is, uh, in general, we have to deal with maybe uh, cyclical object graphs. So, you know, type A references type B, and B as a reference to type A. And you know, if you go, you can start spinning around uh, infinite. You know, get into an infinite loop uh, with that. So you can recognize that you've already seen this guy before and cache it and, and keep a reference to that in the stream, and then pull in that 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 serialized version when you need it. Um, so. If you know that there are no cycles and you have a pretty simple type, and then you can uh, set these references to false, and that'll save some work. You know, the crier will know not to do that. Um, keep in mind that uh, this is a global setting uh, for all streams, so each of your XD instances has to have uh, have the serialization configured the same way, and that's that's generally true. Um, the next thing you can do is. Uh, XD allows you to register a custom serializer for your known payload type, and we'll spend some time looking at this. And what this um, entails basically is uh, 
you write your serializer, you install a jar on the XD class path, you, you drop it into XD lib, and XD will, um, it will pick this up. You, know, the, you basically configure it as beans, and XD will, will uh, auto configure these for you. Um, so let's look at uh, what a custom serializer configuration would look like in XD. Well, we haven't made it like like super uh, flexible or cool, um, but you know because this is such an edge case right now, we have a sort of a hard coded um, package that we're going to scan for these types of extensions. Uh, so you have to put it in a well-known package, spring.xd.bus.ext, and XD um, is a boot app that will will add that pat uh, add that package and scan the jars for, uh, for any classes. And particularly, it's looking for um, beans of type cryo register, which is a strategy interface. And what, um, what um, the uh, type that we use here is uh, called a cryo registration registrar. And that takes a list of registrations. Now, the registration is a is a native cryo class, uh, which turned out to be convenient because the problem is exactly okay. I have to associate a type to a serializer to my custom serializer, and also provide a unique um, ID, which um, cryo uses internally for that type. So, so you can create a list of these things, and uh, and return that now internally. Um, what the message bus uses is a type called Pojo Kodak, and that will uh, take a list of uh, cryo registers and um, and also this uh, this flag to use references that's uh, uh, derived from the property value, and um, and these these values can be null, so it you know typically you don't need to do anything. Um, we'll mention that. XD out of the box does have some custom serializers for the XD tuple type and also for um, the file types. Um, if, we're, if we're translating a Java file, uh, that it, those are really for functional reasons, though. They're not, not for performance reasons. There, there's some, uh, you know, tr serializing a file, you l lose uh, relative path information, and that's, that's by design in the JDK. So we you know, we sort of tweak that so you get kind of the same the same values back uh, on the other side when you uh, restore that file. But so those are really not for performance reasons necessarily, but but really uh, for functionality, which you can do too. Um, so you provide these classes, and it would look something like this, um, where you have to uh, extend um, the cryo serializer. Um, parameterized type for your POJO, in this case is an address, and we know that the address has a street and city and country, and uh, we're going to get a reference to the cryo uh, serializer, serializer, which kind of keeps the state of your serialization. Output is uh, a wrapper around a, an output, a byte output stream, and then uh, your object instance itself, and you're basically going to write these values out in a certain order, and then on the read side, you have to do you know do it exactly read it in that same order. And this is pretty typical of kind of what serialization libraries look like. Um, you know, it's not not too hard to do. So the idea is, you know, if you know know the object, then you're avoiding all this internal reflection that um, Cryo does, and it, it's much much uh, more efficient. Um, the other thing you can do. And this turns out to be a lot simpler in XD because there's no um, no need to do any type of configuration um, or beat you know or create beans that have to be injected into into XD. Is uh, you can uh, ex extend uh, or extend the uh, Pojo type itself. Of course, you have to have access to that domain object uh, typically. In, in some environments, you're using uh, legacy domain objects, and they might be in some library that's developed by somebody else, so you may not have permission to modify the source code. Uh, you know, you could also do some tricks like wrapping to get this kind of, uh, but then you're using a, a, the wrapped domain object in your 
in your model, so that gets kind of ugly too. I think if you, you know, were thinking about doing wrapping, you might as well go with the, the registering, the custom, you know, doing the custom serializers. You've seen a little bit of variation too in the performance, so you, know, you might want to look and see, it, and I'm not sure why, but um, you know, slightly, slightly different numbers doing it this way than doing it the other way, even though the serialization code is identical, so something in the JVM, the stack that could, you know, at the nanosecond level have an effect. Um, but the, the plus of doing it this way is that it'll work out of the box if you, you have your domain objects, and when you're working with domain, with POJOs and XD, they have to be kind of um, known in the class path anyway. So, so if you can do this, um, you don't have to do any, any extra spring config. Uh, but like I said, it requires uh, access or knowledge of the domain types. Um, so I want to look at um, benchmarking because if you're going to, you have a serialization and you've identified that as a bottleneck and you're going to look at custom serialization, um, you're going to want to benchmark and see what, you know, what the effect is. And um, I want to uh, switch over to the ID and kind of look at this, but um, in the Spring XD samples repo, um, I'm going to show you the code now. Um, there's some some uh, benchmark testing that you could modify if you want to do this and you know, really work with um, setting how it would look if you set up the POJO codec and test that in isolation before you you know, go in and tweaking XD and copying jar files around. So hang on, I'm going to put the mic down for a second and. When I grew up, when I was a child and I wanted to know what I wanted to grow up to be, I said, I want to be a mic stand. <laughs> so um, I want to look at this uh, serialization benchmarks project. And um, one thing um, I want to point out is uh, we have uh, copied over this uh, media content object and uh, that graph that was used in JVM Serializer. So there is a benchmark uh, for, for testing that with um, manually optimized cryo. We also um, developed, you know, copied some of their techniques um, for benchmarking. And, it's, and this is really just kind of a baseline to see, okay, yeah, we're with the XD framework and the POJO codec that's wrapping cryo, we're kind of seeing the same, you know, tracking uh, in the ballpark of, of these uh, reported numbers from that, that test, so we're on the right track. Um, there's a class in here, the abstract codec uh, benchmark test, and you'll see things like, like warm up and do garbage collection and things like that. These are, these are techniques that uh, this benchmarking project used that seem like good ideas. You you want to warm up your JVM, make sure your your heap and your perm gen and all that is is warmed up and ready to go to get accurate numbers because the first time you run it, or the first few times. So so the warm up basically runs a test and spins through, um, you know, getting everything everything kind of normalized and and then we do garbage collection periodically, and then we actually run the serialization. Uh, to 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 run to uh, invoke this the serialize method on the codec, and then run deserialization, and then we use the the spring uh, stopwatch to report the results. So uh, so basically, you would um, if you had a POJO and you were you were looking at it, writing a custom serializer for it, uh, you could test that serializer, um, and with this by extending this test and uh, take a look at how we do the media content one. Uh, you basically have to provide a couple of methods, and here um, we get object to serialize. Well, we had that JSON I showed before, and we're gonna use an object mapper and turn that into the POJO uh, before we run the test and return that object. That's the data we're gonna use for these, these benchmarks. Um, and then, you basically also have to configure your POJO codec, um, and this is the same way that XD would, uh, you would register this in XD in a bean, but uh, this is in isolation, so um, 
doing, um, taking the code that uh, they use for the manual cryo benchmark that I showed earlier, um, we're going to register um, all these classes with those serializers and, um, and then run that test. So, so we can do that. The, um, the other thing that's in here is um, another domain object, a, a, uh, a heavier, heavier object called um, where you have a customer order and it's got a customer and the customer has a couple of addresses and, and we have one line item in the order. And um, we generate some, some, uh, some random data and then uh, run, that, run that test on that domain object. And we're going to see um, if I run this guy, we're going to get um, So we have a we have a, a baseline benchmark, which is out of the box um, what you would expect to see with XD, and uh, it's running now. And uh, this will report a number. We also have um, so we're seeing this is uh, twenty three hundred twenty three forty three nanoseconds to serialize and forty two fourteen to deserialize. So we have a couple of other um, examples here. One is uh, the serialize, serializable order, where we've taken the uh, approach of extending <coughs> the uh, domain object itself to, uh, to have the serializer methods in, in the domain object. And then we also have like sort of the optimized, where we're, we're registering the um, the custom uh, serializers here. I'm going to run this one and see what the effect is. <laughs> and you can see we're, we're uh, You'll see this in the XD log too. When you use custom serializers, it'll it'll tell you what uh, what IDs are being used and what custom classes it picked up. Custom serializers. So we're seeing a much better time here, just from because we know the structure of the object and doing this this kind of manual approach. Uh, you know, really good improvement there. So. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything. It's a handheld mic. Who agreed to that? <laughs> so th this chart kind of shows the same kind of thing. So, you, so it does make a difference, but you really should test it. And so if you, uh, are, you need to do that with XD, uh, go to the samples repo and, and plug it in uh, to this testing framework and you know make sure you're getting the kind of performance you need before you go through the trouble of... Um, creating extra spring configuration, dropping jar files into the XD environment, and you know, running your streams with this stuff. Um, so that is it for me. I'm going to hand over to Stefan now. Any uh, questions on serialization? Uh, no, I haven't tried that type of thing. Um, you know, one thing we did did think about is, I mean, there, you can get very sophisticated if you <coughs> can imagine, like, indexing the fields, you know, having some schema in the byte buffer and just being able to pick out parts of that, you know, without having to serialize the whole object. Um, I think there, there could be some major optimizations. I also uh, want to direct, if you're interested in this, um, definitely go see John Davies' talk later today. He, uh, he's done a lot of work with, you know, really, really tweaking um, the serializers and things like that. All right. Um, I'm going just to switch us because I got actually a version conflict in Keynote. Uh, so I, that's why we just switched to uh, um, my laptop. Um, so <laughs> what I'm going to talk about now is actually uh, 
well, after you are sure about your transport layer, after you are sure about your sterilization technology, you maybe start uh, wondering about your processing uh, speed, your pure processing speed, so internally to your processor, what is exactly um, doing your processor, your sink, or your sources, and how they behave specifically. Um, specifically, in fact, if the sink is itself um, slower than the source, obviously you can expect a kind of, <coughs> sorry, a kind of backlog um, building up somewhere either before the transport, uh, before the network hop, or before just call, calling the sink, and that propagates back to the source, basically preventing more, uh, more reads and more event incoming. So if the, if the sync is quite slow, that's going to be your baseline, your rate limitation, basically. In fact, um, another source very similar, another source of uh, rate degradation is a slow processor itself, where you, you can do a call out to um, an HTTP service, for instance, or any kind of, um, any kind of network hop inside your processor just to gather some metrics in the middle um, or, or get some information from um, a REST API. That's the kind of thing that might also quickly degrade your performances in a, in a high processing stream pipeline. Um, and the last, last thing as well is sometimes you might also notice a kind of peak uh, in between, uh, kind of peak of uh, event rate in between, a drop of event rate in between what we call prefetch. Um, so what does it mean exactly is when you process data um, and it's completely synchronous, you can't read more data. Um, it doesn't call for more data before it ends finishing your current processing. But what if you just started calling more data, uh, more f reading for more data actually um, while it's still processing? So for the next uh, iteration, or after, I finish, after the processor finishes processing, it can quickly, uh, basically, fetch from local memory uh, the next data to process. Um, if, you have, if you don't have a prefetch strategy, that's what happens. You will notice kind of spike, um, a kind of peak where you will have drop, and then it goes back again, and then it go uh, down. Because it just, you just have to pay the network costs, which could have been uh, paid in parallel of doing your processing. So, um, how do you mitigate, um, especially um, how do you mitigate the cost of I.O., which is uh, uh, already uh, addressed by uh, Glenn before um, you could start uh, thinking about co-locating your processor and your sync and your source. But Sometimes you might also think about scaling out because you're um, a big shop and you want to, you, you can do everything in, in, in one VM maybe, and it's also very risky. If you lose the VM, you're, you, you're lost basically, and that's, uh, you know, no business can afford that usually. So um, you will start thinking about scaling out, but scaling out actually works to a point. You can scale up to uh, 10,000 uh, parallel nodes. Uh, why that? The, well, the, the, the cost of scaling out the cost of sending data to um, a lot of nodes is going to be compensated at some point by, um, well, actually, the, the benefit of scaling out is going to be compensated at some point by the cost of sending this data to so many different hosts. So you want to, especially in the high, um, high throughput pipeline, you want to reduce and limit the number of uh, nodes in parallel uh, just to avoid, you know, um, this kind of plateau effect you might observe after scanning out. Uh, there is a point where it doesn't matter at um, the number of nodes you have in parallel. So if you can really at some point get more performances by scanning out um, horizontally, you can think about scanning up, so adding for a single node more um, concurrency and pro start processing things in parallel. The thing is, um, in, especially in, um, in the JVM, there is a cost of doing that. Um, using Thread Executor, for instance, is not the most efficient way of uh, doing concurrency, usually. It depends the way we do that, but if you can use frameworks, and we're going to talk about that, that already addressed the issue I'm going to mention, um, that's better. So the first cost you might think about when you use um, Thread Executor is the cost of allocation, because when you use the Thread Executor, you have to send a task, which is basically a neural enable uh, or something similar, and this is going to be uh, pulled eventually by the consumers, the concurrent consumers. But doing new 
uh, one million times uh, per second, it's just going to create a lot of garbage. And remember, we're still in the JVM, and there is this nice thing we call the garbage collection. And the garbage collection will start, uh, well, having not hard time, but still will start, um, start optimizing the cleaning. And this cleaning is going to introduce micropauses in the application, which in the end result in rate degradation. Um, so you want to do efficient uh, message passing, basically, even inside the JVM. And the other thing, um, the other problem of scaling up is the risk you also introduce in your application because when you scale up um, in the GVM, message passing is obviously uh, often done with a queue in between. Um, if you scale up, basically you have a backlog that might build up into this queue. And this queue, the thread executor queue, is not backed by anything, it's in memory. So what happens if you lose that? Um, well, <laughs> you have to think about it. But obviously, we can do a few things uh, around that. So let's start with uh, the blocking I.O. issue inside uh, your processor. When you start doing callouts, uh, when your processor is actually calling an external service before con resuming um, the processing, the pipeline. So classic, if you don't do anything, if you start using HTTP client, for instance, um, or a synchronous REST template to access uh, something external, you're going to have, if you need the request A before doing the request B, before going to, uh, to, to the request C, you're going to start paying the cost of, well, I need to wait for that, even if it returns a future. When you're going to do future.get, it's going to block, so anyway, it's going to defeat the purpose of the, the, the concurrency, basically, because the, the, the sync is only going to receive the message after this free request um, anyway I've finished. Um, so this rate degradation can result into a simple formula where um, you have a rate degradation of A, latency of A, B, and C. Um, and you want to maybe mitigate that. Usually how you mitigate blocking code is by introducing asynchronousity. And introducing asynchronousity or asynchronous boundary bef before these calls is, um, well, is the first smart move, of, obviously but introduce, as I said, a few issues. And the first is you have a new queue in between and you pay a different cost now, which is not the time um, actually spent into requesting things, but the time of sending the message into this new queue. And asynchronous IO doesn't, so, it's not a silver bullet actually, uh, because you're not going to solve permanently your issue. If you have a sync slower than you, your source, or a processor slower than your source um, every time, 100% of the time, it's, well, it doesn't solve anything because you're just going to build up this queue and at some point it will be full and we go back to uh, square zero, which is, well, the queue is full, I'm blocked, source is blocked, I can't read more data. So I'm behaving like a synchronous uh, pipeline, basically. If you don't want to degrade to that stage, um, and if you want to introduce asynchronicity, you have to think that it will just solve a temporally um, peak, basically. It's a buffering layer is just to accept a big hit, a peak of events. Um, if you take an example, for instance, if you have a high stream processing pipeline um, in a telco use case, um, you know, they have a service window where people call between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. That's where the most of the people will call, for instance. So you will observe at this point la uh, large peaks of events per second. But uh, no one's, or, well, yes, some, sometimes people call at uh, 4 a.m., it happens, but much, much less like uh, orders of magnitude uh, less than uh, 4 p.m., for instance. And that's where um, the peaks start being resolved, actually, um, if it happens to be resolved. Because sometimes if you have too much uh, events waiting, the, the other issue is your garbage collection can't uh, be fast enough. And what happens when the garbage collection is not fast enough to solve you, uh, well, your garbage, you generated sending events to another thread? Well, that's simply what we call out of memory. Out of memory is not I'm running out of memory, actually. It's just the time uh, spent in the garbage collection, which is becoming very, very long. Um, and that, of course, is a fatal exception and kills your application, whatever, it, whatever framework you're using out of memory is very hard to recover from. So one of the techniques you can use, obviously, and I'm biased when I say that, <laughs> is uh, to use Reactor, for instance. 
Um, and why Reactor is helping on the aspect of uh, mitigating this garbage generation? Well, because we, we, well, it's not rocket science and we didn't invent anything. We use a structure which is called a ring buffer, a circular buffer, depends how you call it. And the ring buffer has the um, um, ability to, in the case, uh, in the utilization we make of it, it has the nice property of being pre-allocated. So a ring buffer is like a queue with already allocated Renable, and what we do when you, we send an event to a ring buffer, uh, ring buffer which is consumed by a thread, we just simply mutate the state of this pre-allocated Renable, so we don't do new something which is uh, generating the garbage. We have an uh, already capped number of object envelopes. That's quite cool. So we, we will avoid, we, we're not going to reduce 100% of the garbage uh, collection pressure, we start already reducing, and uh, keep in mind we're talking millions of that per second, so we are avoiding new millions, uh, millions of new instances per second, basically. The other thing is um, the concurrent consuming uh, in the ring buffer is very nice. Usually when you have different uh, consumer uh, which have to behave in a pub sub behavior. So two different consumers, two different threads need to receive the same data, basically. Uh, but one consumer can be slower than another one. So usually, um, you know, if you take RabbitMQ, for instance, when you want to do pub sub, you have to actually have two different queues, and the message is duplicated in two different queues, and the consumer uh, will receive the same message and can consume at a different rate. What the ring buffer does, actually, uh, because the ring buffer use sequences, it assigns sequences to uh, these different consumer, and these sequences track uh, for each consumer what they have already consumed. And the ring buffer prevents publishing if one data hasn't been consumed by every consumer. So you don't duplicate the message. They actually stay in the same message passing structure, the same queue. They're not going to two different queues. So, you know, avoiding copy of messages is also a way to reduce uh, garbage collection as well. Um, just to put that in, in some, um, well, in picture, basically, we, how it looks like is simply that when you reach a ring buffer, you schedule a message, you're not executing it in your current thread, so you get, you ask the ring buffer, what is the current available slot, the next current available slot, because I need to mutate, mutate this state so it can be consumed by a consumer at some point. So we do that, which is a blue square, and in parallel, there is one or multiple event loop thread uh, consuming, reading um, continuously in a while true loop um, the, 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 the ring buffer slot. What is the next one I need to read? Because they have their own sequence. And once they read a sequence, they basically execute asynchronously the message. Um, and so from the processor and maybe the sync, if it's in the same uh, VM, or even before sending to the bus, if you use a different transport, and not uh, local transport, it's going to be executed in parallel. And there is a way to use um, this, nice, uh, this nice ring buffer in, in current Spring XD, in Spring XD 1.2 actually, and 1.2.1. 1 1. Uh, well, the, the page where you can actually have more example is located directly in the GitHub, and there is a reference in um, the reference guide from Spring XD. But how it does look like, it's just actually um, an interface you need to implement in your custom module with a simple single method. And this interface has two interesting, uh, well, one interesting input and one interesting output. The interesting input is uh, an object type we call stream, which comes from Reactor. It's a Reactor stream. Basically, it's an, op it's an object where you can attach operation and, uh, for instance, filtering, uh, mapping, or micro, uh, micro aggregates, this kind of um, you know, nifty operation, functional type of operation, just to do something in the processor, um, like counting sampling data and this kind of thing. And so that's really, um, well, that's really if you want to get, start getting into a functional type of programming. But even if you don't do any of that, and we'll see uh, in the example, in the next example, if you even don't do any kind of uh, functional style of programming, well, actually, I've used the map operation in that case, but I could have just returned in put stream because process accepts the message channel um, already running in the, in the concurrent ring buffer thread. 
And if you just return it dir directly, this is just forwarded to the output, so the next step in your uh, Spring XD pipeline. But if you want to do some stuff, you can use the operation of the stream as well before returning it. And for instance, in that case, I just transform using the map operation, I just transform uh, the incoming message from Spring XD into something uh, with, uh, well, in that case, I just concat concatenate uh, Pojopong. Uh, that's one of the examples that actually uh, part of the test suite in the, um, in the Spring XD uh, module. So I could have written input stream alone, or I, I can add this or series of operation, but I'm already at this stage when, for instance, I'm inside the Lambda message, new generic message, um, I'm already uh, in a different thread. I'm already pre-optimized by the module. So that's already a way to avoid you know, this uh, asynchronous issue I just mentioned. Well, by the way, this is not a good example, actually, because I just talked about uh, avoiding cost of allocation. And well, in that case, I'm transforming the data. So uh, I create some allocation garbage as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> But anyway, you see the point. Um, now we think about, we thought about, um, we thought about uh, asynchronous uh, efficiency. We can thought about how we can optimize the design of a processor, especially if we, do, if we uh, do this kind of call out. I just mentioned in the previous sample, I didn't do the call out. But what if I really did this call out to an HTTP remote service? Um, well, there is a few techniques around, and now a very popular one used by, um, well, reactive frameworks is what we call scatter gather or parallel scatter gather, which means instead of doing the sequence like I'm going backwards, sorry, instead of paying the cost of the cascading sequence, why I'm not trying to execute in parallel all these requests and wait for them, but not with a sleep or a blocking wait like future get, but just wait. Um, we've wait for an event basically, so triggering the, the, the continuation of the pipeline only when all of these requests have uh, finished basically. So sorry for the switch. If I if I see that example, what is is simply that doing is um, the request B and C is just going to be done in parallel, and after uh, B and C are done, I'm going to um, chain with the sync. Uh, the sync call, I'm going to only do that when I've received the event, uh, the response back from the HTTP call, for instance. Um, so what does that mean simply for the processor? The processor is not blocked, it continues, um, it continues reading, and actually the backlog is going to be slightly lower than in the previous example where I just introduced the asynchronous boundary, because actually um, even now the processing logic is non-blocking, so the backlog is going to remain quite low even for um, the asynchronous boundary, waiting for events basically when the response go back. So when we compose result this way, avoiding future get, which you should really avoid except if you are doing testing or non-production code, if possible, um, if you want to, if you start reducing, if you start using this kind of uh, pattern, you, well, you can end up with this kind of code. So I'm not saying that you're going to uh, accept this kind of new way, um, this kind of programming right away, but that will be an interesting way to solve this um, uh, scatter Gaza issue. And well, we discussed the way we do this kind of um, asynchronous I.O. callout in the next session at 10.30 with Rosen. Um, but what this code is simply doing, and that's an example with Rx Java, because we have the same, the similar, a similar behavior uh, between Reactor Stream and, um, and, and uh, sorry, and Rx Java. We implement React, uh, we implement some of the reactive extensions. They implement all the reactive extensions, and reactive extensions are just a set of operations, including, uh, in that case, flat map and zip. And flat map is just basically meaning if you were there in the session in introduction to reactive programming. Uh, you know already, but that just means um, I want to merge a result of multiple things happening in parallel. In that case, I'm going to merge a result of an HTTP, asynchronous HTTP call to, I don't know, user profile, uh, using the message, the message header user ID, and I'm going to also, in parallel, uh, aggregate the, the content of a user location, which might be a lot long, and these two HTTP call um, might, re might return a string, a CSV string, so the zip operation is going to wait for, passively wait for one result and a second result from these two HTTP call and combine them and build this massive CSV line you wanted to build and pass it to your sync, for instance. Um, so 
once you, well, you, you can get your head around, and we, we discuss more that topic after, but once you get this op kind of op optimization kicking in, the last thing uh, Reactor or RxJava, all these kind of programming offer to you uh, to optimize your processing flow is what we call um, micro-batching. And be in mind that micro-batching is completely, um, well, it's different from uh, classic batching. It's not, it's not spring batch, it's a risky operation. Um, if you lose a micro batch, which is uh, aggregating over a small period of time, well, you lose it. There is no replayable operation because the point of micro batching is to avoid uh, IO cost. So when, you do, when we construct the micro batches, micro aggregates, we try to be as fast as possible, collect the last, 10 e the last 1,000 events or the last event for one second, and send that to the network. And sometimes, uh, this is an optimization because, you know, network have interesting property and you have to know your hardware. Once is, one of these properties is uh, the MTU. Um, some, uh, also some transport technology have optimized batch size, or optimized, optimized um, message size. And one way to get this um, optimal um, message size or MTU size um, is just to get the right aggregate, uh, merging together a few of the last events and send them in batch basically, but not the massive batch, just the last 1,000 events. But still, this is at this point, if you start doing that, you have to keep in mind it's a risky operation. This is not spring batch at all. It's not replayable. So if you do that, make sure that before maybe you acknowledge or you use a kind of acknowledgement on your transport technology, for instance, you don't consume the event from RabbitMQ if they were sitting in RabbitMQ. Otherwise, if you lose this node, well, you have no way to replay them. Uh, I really want to emphasize that because people say, oh, you know, um, if we have micro-batching and this kind of new technique where we use operation like windowing, so windowing is a, um, an operation taking the last uh, x, x number of events or the last uh, number of time, um, number of seconds or whatever events. Um, if you start using this operation and people tell me, well, why do you use then um, uh, things like spring batch, well, they are completely different things. Um, this is just a way to optimize the size of a packet, basically, uh, where, you know, it, it, as I just say, it's completely risky operation. You do that when you're actually sure of your transport layer, you know that you have still your message somewhere in case uh, something happens. It doesn't solve all of the issues spring batch is actually solving. And in that case, so it, we go back to um, actually um, uh, reactor example, um, I just noticed actually <laughs> I, I was probably a bit uh, um, tired, but it's micro bashing. It's obviously it's micro batching, <laughs> but it's micro, well, micro bashing as well. Um, <laughs> it's a, this input stream is going to be so the incoming, it translates the incoming input channel messages, uh, aggregate them for 1000 messages, but doesn't wait. 1,000 messages, so you know if you send only 999 uh, um, messages, actually it's not going to wait forever before triggering the rest of the, the pipeline because there is another limit, which is a time. And when you do asynchronous processing like that, it's important to, to um, give boundaries in time and in size if possible. And this is a kind of all condition. Is it 1,000 or one second? One of them is reaching first, we send this packet to the next operation. Um, and then because window creates substreams so or sub, um, subsequences of events, which are the, the microaggregates, the, the bounded microaggregates, we, inside the flat map, which is merging back these microaggregates, we use what we call also in reactive extension reduce operation, which is um, just a way to say accumulate into something. And if you look at this reduce code, it's just accumulating into a string because the, the first argument is the initial, um, the initial um, object instance, and we receive it in the previous uh, argument. In the lambda, you can see there is prev and next, a two argument method. Um, so the first prev value is going to be this empty um, string, and the next va uh, first value is going to be, well, the first message coming in, and so on. So we accumulate n and n plus one every time. And in this case, because um, well, let's imagine it's a, kind, uh, it's a protocol where we have a comma delimited um, packet. We accumulate using comma every time, every time. And in the end, we have this massive, well, micro-massive packet of 
maybe 1,000 or maybe 500 messages because if the one second uh, trigger might have kicked in before. And we are ready to send that to the transport layer or to a sync. This is optimized message size, but you don't know if it's optimized before testing. So first, before getting to the state, uh, you need to get metrics, uh, data point from um, your network, your processing pipeline, and then you can start playing with this kind of um, paradigm and new patterns. This is the right order. So, you, well, you all know that um, premature op optimization is mother of all evil, and that's uh, actually quite an optimization. So, I am done. I think we, if anyone has question, not necessarily about reactive. Um, if you have also more questions about what the fuck I just seen in this code, uh, as I said, there is a session just after. Take two or three coffee, but it's going to be fun actually because it's uh, about um, doing uh, web with uh, this kind of programming style. Any, um, you don't want to add uh, anything, Glenn or Dave? No. Any question? Any question? Maybe. Oh, sorry. Yep. So I was looking at the one several slides back up where it was showing the observable one on the left in the code. Yep. So how is this different from the other? I mean, you're getting observ observ um, observable here. Yes. So is this the thing that's processing the observable or is it? Uh, so. Act, the process method is not going to be invoked every time you receive a new message. It's only, in, it's only invoked um, at um, starting time, basically one. Um, yeah, sorry. So repeating the question. The question was um, when the message is actually uh, passed to this observable. Um, was it that? All right. So. When you invoke this process method, well, you don't invoke this process method. It's invoked by Spring XD on startup, one or end time, because you can configure, actually, I don't show uh, the fine tuning, but you can configure the uh, number of parallel um, observable you can receive. And inside the observable, you receive what we call a sequence of uh, messages. This is actually a kind of future, non-blocking, but not only with one result, with one to many results, and that's where actually the message flow. Uh, it's kind of embedded micro uh, data flow. It's not you know full blown. It's not distributed. It's just inside your processor. It's like you know the same, the micro ver version, the light version of stream processing, but inside uh, inside a contained inside a processor basically. Uh, okay. Any other question? Right. Thank you very much.